Yes. Yes, it is.
agree. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Happy to see your faces as always. And happy that we're here. And, you know, I know he said some of you are probably a little put off by the cold weather, but I'm feeling good. So, you know, something for everybody, I suppose. We're going to have a wonderful morning this morning. It's already been so great. We're glad that we have, you know, we're kind of in a season of back and forth. We didn't have Pastor Richard last week. Boom, here he is. He appears. And now we are missing a few others. So, you know, just the way as the church goes. I wanted to remind you that on top of all the wonderful things we always have, like our adult class before this, we have our morning service in <coughs> Fireside, which is tonight at 6. If you didn't know, all are welcome. Come fill your stomachs and your hearts in all the best ways. We have Mother's Day coming up. I feel like I'm kind of like your uh, notifications on your phone, your reminds. I'm your reminder. So your reminder today is Mother's Day is coming up. We'll have a special service that day. It's been advertised to all the rest of our community. Anybody is welcome. Bring your moms, bring your grandmas, bring your mother figures. You, if you're a mom, bring yourself. We want you here. We want everybody here. So please join us. It's on the 12th. So if you need that in your brain, start ordering your gifts now. If you just had a panic moment, you got a little time. I'm here for you. Thank you, sweetheart. I'm so glad to be home more than you would ever know. I don't mean to put down other states as compared to Illinois. But I didn't see a drop of water all across New Mexico, not one drop. The trussels underneath the railroad tracks, you could see where they have flash flooding all the time because the sand, you could see waves of sand, but not a drop of water. So in Arizona, they can have their palm trees, they can have all their cactus, they can have all their pebbles and their rock that are earth tones, everything drab and brown. And if you have any grass in Arizona, I'm sure you have to pay big bucks to have just a portion of grass in your yard. So I found myself more than once down in Mesa saying this, thank you God for central Illinois. Thank you for everything green. Thank you, Father, for the green cornfields. And Lord, I thank you for the green soybean fields. So I, I did a lot of thanking. Saw such little water, even in Mesa. We drove past a uh, canal, and it's half full of water. Right beside it was a little pond on a golf course. And I was so taken by surprise that I looked at my brother and his wife, and I said, Water. There's water. <laughs> hey, folks, I'm thankful for the streams and the creeks and the rivers in Illinois. Thank you. You did good, huh? I'm thankful for the water, too. Yes. And now we have my Uncle Sean. He told me the title, and I said, what? So it's what it is, and I can't wait to get a better explanation of what he said. It's going to catch you, too. So let's join me in welcoming Sean Crenshaw. So I thought about pulling my pants out of the closet, it looks like Lexi's, but I just don't wear them nearly as well as she does, so. Plus I'm not sure y'all wanna see me like up to there with my, with my pants. It's good to see everybody, I'm not gonna start naming off names because then I gotta go through everybody in here so nobody gets foot left out and gets their feelings hurt, so. Cause that's the society we live in, everybody gets their feelings hurt and everybody gets a voice no matter what. So. I've been up here for a while, and uh, it's, it's good to be up here, and good to see everybody. And uh, like I said, Mom's not here. We're a little light this morning, so it doesn't matter. We have Asher, so that fills the whole place. See, I named one person. There we go. I named Asher. Um, who, by the way, I told everybody last week, I'm like, the boy has stretched. And he has stretched. He lost a pound and stretched four inches, so he, he has stretched. I can tell. I'm like, he doesn't feel as much like a lead weight. He's a little bit more spread out when I'm holding him now, so... So here's the reason Lexi's like, huh? Title, if I had a title for the message this morning, it'd be off with their heads. And I think we all know where that, where that, Sarah's excited already. She's like, whoo. Yes, off with their heads. So, you know, I bring a message. I always try to make sure it's never directed towards one person because usually that person doesn't get it anyhow. It goes right over their head. 
And then the rest of the congregation suffers. They're like, what was that? Well, that was for one person. And then that person's like, oh. Matter of fact, I've seen some people, you could blatantly look at them. I'll just use Amanda for an example since she's on the front row. And I could say, I, and I could say that person in the front with blonde hair, and they'd be like, I can't be talking about you. So, <laughs> so I try, try to make sure it's, it's relevant to, to everybody and, and it's going to impact everybody. But I'm going to start, I'm going to talk about grudges this morning, but I'm going to kind of get a path as we go there this morning as well. So there's a story I'm sure some of you have heard, maybe, maybe even all of you or most of you have heard, but there was a little boy who had a terrible temper problem. I'm sure none of us know any kids like that. I'm sure Asher won't have a temper, a redheaded temper issue at all when he starts getting a little bit older. But had a, a severe temper problem, and his dad was like, okay, enough's enough. So his dad said, here's what you're going to do. The fence in the front yard, you're going to take a nail. And every time you lose your temper during the day, you're going to hammer a nail into the fence. So it started out very first day. Johnny, we, I, don't, I don't know why we always pick Johnny. I'm just going to, hey, hey, Zeus, I don't want to come up with a different name. But hey, Zeus gets out there with his hammer and his nail. Nails in 30, and it hits the nail. 36 nails he nails into the fence that day. He lost his temper 36 times. Then the next day, a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less. It finally gets down to the point where he went a full day without losing his temper, and he told his dad, he said, hey, I didn't lose my temper one time today. His dad, dad said, awesome. Now what I want you to do is every day that you don't lose, uh, lose your temper, I want you to pull a nail out. Back out of the fence. So he gets to the point, he does so good about holding comes to his dad, he said, hey, I have every nail out of the fence now. I haven't, haven't lost my temper. His dad said, you did a great job. Now I want you to go back and look at that fence. Look at all the holes that are still in that fence from every time you lost your temper. You may do a good job of holding your temper now, but look at all the damage you've done by not holding your tongue. Look at the damage you've done and the permanent damage that's there that you've left behind, even though you've done a good job now of holding your temper and not speaking your mind. And I know some people, they, they think it's awesome. It's like a, a bling on their shoulder if they're like, yeah, I just always speak my mind and whatever I'm thinking. The Bible tells us only a fool utters his whole heart and his whole mind and everything that he is thinking. And I've told dad and dad made the same statement to me. There would be people slain all over the state if I opened up my mouth every time that I had a thought about somebody, especially at work. Um, not that any of us have coworkers that we don't like at all. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. I like everybody. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I, I love, I like every single person I come in contact with. I'm going to move because God's going to, I will move after that. But we got to realize what we say causes damage. And we can't always undo that damage. And what the words are out the route. And once we have created damage, sometimes it's, it's out there to, to, to stay. Now let's take this a step further. I'm sure every one of us has either held a grudge or been on the receiving end of somebody that's held a grudge against us. First of all, if there's anybody in here that can say they've never held a grudge in their life, you should probably be the one like crucified on the cross. I mean, now, if you want to raise your hand now and say, Sean, I've never held a grudge towards anybody in my life, feel free to do so. But holding a grudge takes it a step further, and holding a grudge will eat at us as a human being. We're not just damaging that other person. We're damaging ourselves, and sometimes ourselves more than the other person is damaged. The Bible talks about the result of holding grudges. There's verse after verse after verse after verse after verse about holding our temper, holding our tongue, holding grudges against somebody. And I'll get into a couple of those stories, probably the most two prominent <laughs> biblical stories I can think of that has to do with a grudge. What is a grudge? A grudge is when you hold something against somebody. Really, it's a, 
not even a fair judgment against them because you might your grudge against them might elevate way above what the actual initial offense was towards you. But some of us, when we are offended, our defense mechanism is to hold a grudge against somebody. The problem is, and the Bible preaches directly against, especially a child of God holding a grudge ever, ever. And I'll get into that here in a little while as well. But it's well known scientifically, psychologically, you can look into it. Same thing with stress in your life, holding a grudge will have a detrimental physical effect on your life as well. The byproduct of it, it will eat away at your health, it will eat away at your mind. A grudge held long enough will eventually create spiritual and or physical death. Of course, I'm more concerned about the, the spiritual death in this case than I am the, the physical death because all of us, whether we like it or not, all of us are eventually dying. I know, it's hard to believe, but it happens. It happens to all of us. Sean will always say there's two things for sure in life, death and taxes. Matter of fact, our IRS just bragged that they raked in a record number of tax money this year. There's a good bragging point. I'm sure we've all felt it too, but we won't get into that today. Um, <laughs> but a grudge will eventually result in spiritual and or physical death. Oftentimes we damage ourselves more than we damage others when we have a grudge. You know what's sad? When you can take the Hatfields and McCoys, you can take yourself possibly sometimes people hold a grudge so long they don't even remember why they originally held that grudge against somebody and here's the problem when you hold a grudge against one person long enough it might bleed into other people as well because it just become, you just begin to have a hard heart in general <clears throat> and here's the problem just like that fence the old holes were permanent you can say, oh, Sean, you can fill them. Guess what, though? That hole is still there. You're just filling it with something artificial. <clears throat> but if you hold a grudge long enough, sometimes you learn to live with it. Some people can still learn to live with a grudge and think that they're okay. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm okay. I can compartmentalize my life. I can be okay with this grudge over here, but I can still live my life without it impacting me. That's a lie. We cannot live our lives holding a grudge without it impacting us. And we might learn to live with it or think we have, but guess what? It leaves you with a limp. Just like that fence had holes in it, it will leave you with a limp. It'll leave you with a permanent scar. It'll leave you with a permanent mark. Matter of fact, there's a tree out at Nichols Park that's always kind of caught my attention. It's over by the big new pergola or whatever that they have. But there was a fence post, a steel fence post, that was originally next to that tree. Caitlin's shaking her head. She knows which one I'm talking about. But it was close enough to that tree as that tree grew. It grew around that fence post and started to develop it. And somebody might say, oh, that's fine. It wrapped it around it. But that fence post being inside of that tree eventually caused that tree to rot out. And that tree is eventually toppled over or part of it has been ripped off at this point from the wind. So we can think, ah, oh, it's okay, I can hold a grudge and I'm okay. But we are like that tree where it continues to eventually rot us from the inside out, both spiritually and physically. <clears throat> Paul says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Boy, if we could all live by that one, it'd be great. So in other words, don't go to bed angry and don't hold that anger into the next morning. Okay, am I the only one in here that's ever held anger overnight towards somebody? Hey, we have one honest person in here. Becky's like, I haven't, never. Only if I have a bad dream about Dave and make him sleep on the couch for a week for no reason. We've all been there. Sometimes isn't it amazing some of the things that we allow to get into our spirit and we get angry about and we blow up about and then we realize afterwards how dumb it was. That's usually, even though Holly, Crystal, and I don't argue often at all. We really we truly don't. But usually when we do, it's like World War III, like an atomic bomb went off. And at the, then when I look back on them, I'm like, man, that was a really dumb fight that we had. 
And sometimes we look like a complete fool in the middle of an argument. We'll go crazy, and then afterwards we're like, man, I look like a complete idiot. Matter of fact, that's how I view myself at stoplights. I'm like, Sean, you must look like a total idiot yelling at this stoplight. So I'm thinking, what do we look like from somebody else's perspective if they're looking at us? But Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. <clears throat> and he gives a twofold reason. It's not to be prolonged beyond the sunset, beyond the sleep which ends the old day. We should leave what's in the past in the past. We should be able to wake up the next morning with freshness and new in which by any godly man must be prepared for in, in the combination of himself to God and in prayer for forgiveness as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's a parable that I think Sean just mentioned a couple weeks ago, but People owed him money. The person that he owed money to forgave him his debt, but that person then was a tyrant about the people that owed him money. The Bible is very careful about telling us, hey, forgive those who trespass against us. If there's no difference between us and the world, what's the truth? <clears throat> I'm going to pause there for a moment. I'm going to take a little sidebar just because. So there was a kind of a blow up in my pile of life conference that was held in Springfield, Missouri, that <clears throat> at the middle, at the beginning of a mid-Christian conference, this thing, Sean, you're on, you're being recorded, I understand this, but hey, it's already viral, so it doesn't really matter if I say it or not. But at the very beginning of this conference, there was some entertainment, but there was also a man that came down, stripped his shirt off, swallowed a sword and climbed up what looked like a stripper pole up and down this, this pole in the middle of this men's Christian conference. And another pastor called out the situation in front of everybody. But his point was, if we're going to go to something, if you're going to try to draw people into the kingdom of God, if they can't see a difference between you and the world, what is the truth? other than to brag about how many people or how large your congregation is, how many people that you at least got to walk down the aisle, what's the point? Paul, another, another point, bullet point two about not letting the sun go down your wrath, it's something that if you brood over <clears throat> or if you focus on or if you dwell on long enough, guess what? All you do is make it grow. It's like the rumor weed we talked about. I think I had somebody mention that last week too. But the rumor weed and veggie tails, where it just suddenly just becomes so big that that you can't you can't get away from it anymore. If you dwell on something long enough and you hold a grudge, grudge long enough, it becomes bigger <coughs> until it will consume you. Ephesians four twenty nine. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. I'm going to come back to that in a second again as well. As fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. <clears throat> there are some people, and I've mentioned this before, but there are some people who think that gossip is just telling lies about somebody. It is not. Gossip is anything that we do when we're talking about somebody, if the person There's some people I know that have a hotline. In fact, I could probably name several groups of people, but I won't start naming names just because you know, you know. But have hotlines to each other, and it's gossip fest 101, and they would invite me to argue with people. We're just talk, we're, it's, we don't talk about it. It's not something we're arguing about. It's, just, it's still gossip if the purpose is to tear somebody down and to slander somebody to somebody else. That is still gossip. Gossip doesn't have to be a lie. It can be the flat-out truth, but if your purpose is... Same way I've said before, some people use terrorist as a kind of gossip. They don't really care if Susie that's having marital problems has some sort of healing from God in that situation. What they really want to do is gossip and be like, let's pray for Susie this morning. She's having marital problems. 
<clears throat> the whole purpose wasn't to sit there and say that you really care about Susie. It was, hey, this is a good time to gossip. I'm going to use prayer request time as a time to gossip and just be like, let's pray for Susie. She's had a marital problem. <clears throat> Well, there's no Susie's in here this morning. All right, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> no, I wasn't talking about anybody. Um, I got a reaction, though. Um, so let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption by gossiping. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. So let's stop there for a minute as well. Do we not realize we would all be bound for hell if it were not for the grace of God? God has forgiven us no matter how great or how small we think our sins were or we think our life was. What kind of audacity do we think that we have as a Christian to then not be forgiving of other people? Now there is a line. Let's talk about this for a second. Forgiving somebody doesn't mean you buddy up with that person. It doesn't mean you have to stay close to that person or let that person or people in your inner circle. It doesn't mean, according to Scripture, we're not supposed to be wise as Christians and gentle and as Paul promised as doves. We're supposed to be wise as Christians and not surround ourselves with people like that, the people that will get into our soul and into our spirit. But we're still supposed to forgive them. That's an obligation as a Christian. It should be part of our DNA and our nature as a Christian to automatically forgive somebody else. Because why? Because Christ forgave us. That's why. That is why. Colossians 3, 12 through 13 Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Some of the meanest people I know are self-proclaimed Christians. Some of the least compassionate people I know are self-proclaimed Christians. Some of the most evil people I know are self-proclaimed Christians. They have no sense of compassion, no kindness, no humility, no weakness, no patience. I can work on the patience part, depending on the situation. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Boy, there's like a repeated theme here, especially for those of us that are believers. And you might say, oh, a grudge doesn't do anything but just hurt myself, and I'm okay, and everything's okay, and there's no detrimental spiritual effect here. But there is. Dad's one who always likes to say, hey, there's, there's that word if in the Bible. There's always qualifications in the Bible. There's, hey, God will do this for you, but there's this. There's stipulations. Matthew 6, and this is one of my favorite verses about forgiveness, but it is powerful and it's amazing and hard for us to even get our minds around it, and it should be something that would scare us to death if we hold a grudge. Matthew 6, 14 through 16. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, if you hold a grudge and unforgiveness in your heart, guess what? God's not going to forgive you. You are literally a walking dead man at that point. That We cannot, as a Christian, hold grudge towards other people. It will not only eat away at us, but it says if we aren't willing to forgive others, God will not forgive us either. That is a hard pill for us to swallow sometimes. As I mentioned, that doesn't mean you buddy up with people all the time. You can forgive them and still keep them at an arm's length. You can forgive somebody and still never want to have anything to do with them again because it's not wise to do so. So, whoa, got a little too close. So, wow, I'll stay away from that. Um, so there's two, two really key stories in the Bible that have to do with grudges and forgiveness or people that could have held grudges but did not. 
So you have the story of Saul and David. Where Saul held a grudge against David and sought to kill him. And David could have, David could have in turn held a grudge, but instead he didn't. But my favorite Bible story about holding a grudge is the story of Joseph and his brothers. If ever anybody in the Bible could have held a grudge, it would have been Joseph. Now, did he, did he provoke his brothers? Yes. Was he a bit arrogant? Uh, yeah. Was he a bit cocky? Uh, yeah. Not that I'm ever cocky. Just kidding. Um, doesn't happen. I just tell people that when I played softball when I was younger. I'm like, I'm not arrogant. I'm just cocky. I know, I, I know I'm good. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> Matter of fact, I remember playing out at Moose Lodge, out at, uh, and uh, I remember a guy one time was like getting ready to round third base, and I was in the outfield, and I had the ball, and I literally was yelling, I'm like, I dare you to go, you won't get halfway down the line, go ahead. Um, but Joseph, if anybody in the Bible could have, and should have, well, I won't say should have, but if anybody could have held a grudge, it would have been Joseph. Brothers, can you imagine your own siblings selling you off to somebody else in slavery on purpose and then turn around and lying to your parent and being like I don't know what it must be. here's what his coat we found it it looks like there's blood all over it must have been a wild animal that killed him so as Joseph's in Egypt and here's a couple points I'm going to get to as I'm wrapping up here Joseph was in prison. I won't go through the whole story, but he was thrown in jail. And when he got out, of course, he was elevated to a position of, of authority and power, the right-hand man to Pharaoh. But when the famine came in the land and his brothers had to come and they didn't realize Joseph was who he was, is, in my opinion, one of the most powerful scenes, and I've mentioned this before as well, but one of the most powerful scenes in the Bible. So here's Joseph, his brothers in front of him that literally threw him in a pit, sold him into slavery. And he knows it's them. They just don't know it's him. He literally holds their, holds their life in his hand. He, had a, he could have just turned them away and not given them any food and let them starve to death. And a lot of us would probably be like, that's what they did. Get what they deserve. How many of us have said that before? That's just what they do. They, they get what they deserve. That doesn't mean that there shouldn't be repercussions for sin. And that's why we have laws, too. There's repercussions for doing things we shouldn't do. <clears throat> but Genesis 43, starting at verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into, this ha into the house to him the, the present that they had with them and bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father is well, he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves, and he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and he said, Is this the youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to my son. But Joseph had such compassion <clears throat> It was overcome with so much emotion. It said, Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother and he sought a place to weep and he entered his chamber and he wept there. We have somebody that was thrown in a pit, sold into slavery by his brothers that could have held a grudge, could have turned them away and instead it said he was overcome with such emotion that he had to get out of their presence so he could just cry uncontrollably and weep and here's the problem if we hold a grudge guess what even though Joseph was physically out of that prison out of that jail cell that he was in he would have stayed there and remained there in that prison and in that cell spiritually and emotionally if he had held a grudge and that's what we do on ourselves if we hold a grudge against somebody we will keep ourselves permanently in a cell permanently bound up locked up and that's where we stay and that's where we remain so 
How do you know that you graduated in the grudge mentality that you're in? It's when instead of giving an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it's instead of holding something against somebody, it's when you become like Joseph. And here's the best example I can give you about taking something out. The Bible tells us what Satan means for harm. God will turn around for good. And like I said, we've either been on the receiving end of a grudge or we've been the one holding the grudge. And most likely all of us have been both. But a pearl is formed not under good circumstances. A pearl is formed... When a piece of sand or an irritant gets into a clam shell and starts to irritate where it actually comes from, and they begin to form this fluid that slowly surrounds that piece of sand or that irritant, and they're all doing it as a self-preservation mechanism. But what happens? When it happens long enough, an actual pearl forms. When we can take something that Satan's meant for bad, or if we can take a grudge that we've held against somebody, how do you know you graduated when you learn how to make something good out of what Satan meant for harm? And let me tell you, Satan will use a grudge, you holding a grudge, to try to bring you down, especially knowing that if you can't forgive others, God will not forgive you. So even though a pearl is not formed under the best circumstances, look what is actually created by that piece of sand or that irritant that ends up forming a defense mechanism that actually ends up creating something beautiful. So Lexi off with her head is, hey, I'm going to slay that person because they did me wrong. I'm going to do that person wrong because they did me wrong. That's our flesh man talking, our spirit man once we're saved, it doesn't say that we're a new and better version of who we are. It says we're a brand new creation completely. Our DNA has changed completely. And even though it might be easy for us to hold a grudge against somebody, the damage that you're creating to yourself and maybe even that other individual. Matter of fact, what if that other individual isn't a Christian? Guess what? You might have just turned that person off and never wanted to step into the house of God or ever accepting Christ because they're looking at you thinking oh they're supposed to be a Christian I don't want what they have because look how they are we can't see sometimes the fallout from our actions and God doesn't give us commandments to make our lives terrible and boring and say we can't do this he does it as protection to us Lord, we just thank you this morning, God, for being awesome and amazing that you always are. God, even when we can't see it, as Cameron was talking about this morning, oftentimes, God, we like to just take control of things, but you're awesome even in the midst of the storm, even when we don't see it, even when it doesn't happen as quickly as we want to, even when your solution doesn't meet our standards sometimes, God, because we look at the short term instead of the long term. God, even in those times, you're awesome. I pray this morning that the message came through me the way that you wanted it to, that it hits home, that we get it into our hearts. God, it may not have been something deep and in depth, but Lord, it's something that impacts all of our lives. Be with each of us this week. Keep us all safe. In your name, amen.